I mean, the whole story, I mean, the fact that put somebody in the cement block and then they weren't smart enough to cut his stomach open uh, and he floats up to the surface and washes ashore and that's how the whole thing started. I mean, it's, it's kind of wacky. In 1964, the bloated body of Ernie the Hawk Rapolo, a one-eyed hitman from Baldwin, was found in Jamaica Bay. He became hated in the Mafia in the 1940s because he rolled on mob boss Vito Genovese, and from then on, he was reviled by every other mobster in New York. It's no wonder he wound up dead. These particular photos, it shows my father, James Mosley, and this is Willie Rupolo. And he testified, he lent his brother, Ernie the Hawk, the particular pants they're looking at. You know, I look at it from a lawyer's mind, and I'm like, wow, he's up against the top guys. Every one of their witnesses was a admitted felon, multi-felon. And really, what they, were, they had is hearsay. You had the one eyewitness who saw them putting a body in the trunk. But I don't even think one could make a, a more complicated movie now, I don't even know if anyone can follow it, it's so complicated. Does Mr. Francesi still say he didn't do this? Yes. Mm. That's interesting. remember that when the trial was on in the Queens County Courthouse, before and after the verdict, I was wandering around photographing what we were calling the bad guys. And I was using a flash on the camera and snapping away at them. And I was surprised that nobody objected. You know, they didn't say, hey, cut that out, kid. And later it was pointed out to me that there were oh, six to eight detectives there just hoping that one of them would approach me or try to push me or something so they could beat the out of him. You know, I didn't realize it at the time. I thought I was pretty cool <laughs> running around and being Mr. Brave, not realizing that I was bait. This is a Life magazine um, oh, let's get rid of article this. about, uh, I'll turn it to the page, and it's about the Rapolo case. Some tourist had reported it's Jamaica Bay off Breezy Point. Imagine how ornery this guy was. I don't remember how many times he was shot. Supposedly he came to life at one point. He was stabbed about 12 or 13 or 14 times. I don't remember how many and he had two concrete blocks. They were substantial cement blocks. And uh, he was tied to them by chains, some kind of yellow rope. And he was covered in some kind of celluloid wrapping or something. And he floated ashore. I mean, that's unbelievable. According to this, there were six, bu there's six bullets, but there were more than that in them. There were more than that in them. And this is, I think this is Jamaica Bay, where they, near where they found the body of Ernie the Hawk. My name is Marion Mosley, and my father prosecuted Sonny Francis for the murder of Ernie the Hawk Rapolo. I remember not being allowed to answer the phone because people were calling and threatening my parents, I guess. One day, my mother packed us all up and took us about a mile away to a hotel, and we spent the night there. Right, well, my, I had no idea that, why. I, I remember the same thing, that because of what was perceived as some sort of danger from the case that my father was working on, which we interpreted as like someone was out to get us as kids, you know. Um, but I think it was what, you know, we commonly call a death threat now. But it's interesting, Mr. Friends, he's just the only living Mm. participant of these events. I mean, it's really amazing. Look, I have some other pictures. Yeah, let me see. 
This one's a famous one. Oh, this is me that I like that for the homicide, they think. Yeah, this is for uh, Rapallo. This is for Ernie the Hawk. It's the, I mean, you know something? If I tell you something, look, I beat the case. If I, if I did it, I would tell you. I didn't even know the guy. I never met him. Never knew him in my life. Never met him. And if there's a guy up above, strike me dead this minute if I'm lying to you. I never met him. So you didn't order him hit? Never knew none of them. Let me hear, why would I want to deal with, with garbage like that? Tell me. I mean, I never knew them. Never saw them in my life. Yes, I do think that Sonny Frances ordered the crime, although there were many that differed with us. Sonny Frances was the big deal, was the major domo, was the mafioso, was the chief. And I don't think they would have rubbed out Ernie the Hawk without uh, the permission of Sonny Frances. I don't think he would have prosecuted somebody unless he really believed they were guilty. It just was a major, the, the major case. I mean, there were no seats available in the trial. You had to know somebody to, to get a seat. Jim was a fantastic lawyer. I learned a lot from him. As a prosecutor, I learned a lot from him. But he showed when he was PO'd or unhappy. He was just wrapped up in that case. I remember it I, just all the time. And yeah. uh, it was like not having a father for a year. And so when the acquittal happened, what was the reaction in the DA's office? It was cataclysmic. We were, everybody was disappointed. In those days, when Mafia men were in trouble, help had a way of suddenly appearing out of nowhere. And in this case, it came in the form of a surprise witness, who was revealed just 31 minutes before the judge started instructing the jury. The witness was Walter Scher, who was on death row at Sing Sing. He testified that a key prosecution witness, John Rapaki, had confessed to killing the hawk. Rapaki vehemently denied this, but it was enough to sway the jury, and Sonny was acquitted. To be honest, they probably should have called the mistrial. Well, looking at it in hindsight, they definitely should have called the mistrial. We were all, I mean, we were surprised. Everyone seemed kind of surprised that he got off because it was so obvious that to us anyway that he was guilty. Yeah, um, to us. I just remember afterwards, we all went across the street to a bar called Luigi's. I'm sure you've come across that. Well, we went over there and I took some pictures of pretty glum looking faces at the bar. And uh, that sort of was the end of it, I think. After the acquittal, the prosecutors went to a neighborhood bar, Luigi's in Queens, to drown their sorrows. Meanwhile, Sonny had a more upscale celebration at the Copacabana. Did you ever see him at the Copa or any of these clubs? Did you see him? We, we were at the Copa uh, together. He was like the, the pre an emperor. We were having a drink at the, the bar. Sonny went off and I was there with my late wife. And so some guys came over to make a move on her. And all of a sudden, there were two guys who appeared who took those potential, you know, pains in the ass immediately away. They disappeared. <laughs> I must have met Sonny a hundred times. Hello, goodbye. First of all, I didn't sit down with these people at Tacoma, and that's the last thing you want to do, because anywhere they went, the feds followed them. They'd be sitting in places. In fact, a couple of guys would send them Cristal just to get them crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Take that Coca-Cola and give up on the Cristal. <laughs> and Sonny Francisi, Copacabana, never go through the front door and there was no more room. Put a table on the corner of the stage. They did, no matter who the entertainer was. Put a table on the corner of the stage. Sonny was out, he loved the, the people. He loved the public. He wanted them all to know who he was. At the Russian tea room, 
We had the first booth on the left. This was before opening hours. That was Sonny's booth in those days. First booth on the right was Jacqueline Kennedy's. I remember once I went to um, the old Madison Square Garden with him where I saw Cash's clay fight oh. before he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. I was just so a little bit in awe of uh, Sonny. Men who have that kind of power, they also exude some sort of, whoa, you know, a magnetic kind of wow. And I remember walking down 8th Avenue and I remember waiting for the light and he said to me, now look pretty because they're going to take my picture here. People that don't know him, He's like a legend. He's like a legend to me. But you know, when you start to talk to people like Sonny, he's in the category of Costello, Gambino. Sonny's a very respected man, until right now. His legacy would have to be go through the film business. There's so many things that you see in different movies that he was responsible for, like Bronx Tale, when those, um, when those guys on the motorcycles that was Sonny who did that. The producers used to go to him to get top stars and convince them to take the part. We'd be in a Warwick having breakfast. And movie stars would come over and want to say hello to him. He was definitely the Don Juan of the mob. Women are drawn to these guys. They love that dark area and it's very sexy. He was a... Uh just attracted. I mean, he, he, and there were some big names that I didn't even want to get into. Big names. Big name women of the world, besides the actresses. Did you have an affair with Marilyn Monroe? What's the difference? The woman, listen, the woman is dead, leave her alone. My mother passed away five years ago. And we, I was in prison visiting him, and he said to me, you know, I never wanted to tell you this when your mother was alive, but I can tell you this now. I said, what? He said, I had an affair with Marilyn Monroe. He says, and I was dating her. I met her at the store club. He said, uh, you know, Costello introduced me to her because she had something to do with the place at the time. He says, and we had an affair. He waited all that time to tell me until my mother passed away. He said, I don't want to disrespect your mom while she was alive. You know what Jim Mansfield told me? If I tell you, you don't, don't, don't say I told you. Oh, tell me, she's dead, tell me. She said to me, you know something, Sonny? She said, here I am in, a, in, in, in an affair with you, the 500 people. You're the best looking guy in here. She said, you're the best looking guy I ever went out with. Not that I want to brag, but I was in demand at that time. <laughs> the woman went crazy. So did you know Frank Sinatra? You said it wrong. Frank Sinatra. It's not to know me. He wants to be catered to all the time. See, I used to play it right. When I used to see him, I made God, I don't see him. He'd come back to me and talk aloud so I could hear him. I wouldn't turn around. <laughs> so did Sinatra know you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Very good. Sinatra, Dean Martin, all of them. The words are true. The song is you. You say, Sonny, I idolized you? Yeah, he idolized me because I was, I had, you know, 29 gold records. So we were good friends. Um, Whenever we sat down at a restaurant, our backs had to be turned to the wall, and, and that's the truth. So what did he do to help uh, sell your record? How, how did he promote it? Uh, with force. But one day I was, I was with my dad, we were driving to, uh, we went into the city, because he had the record company at the time, Buddha Records. It was my dad, Johnny Irish, and Red Crabby. And uh, my dad got out of the car, and he met somebody on the street, and he wasn't happy with the guy. He started yelling at him, and I'll, I'll never forget Bobby. He grabbed him around the throat, 
and he just kind of lifted him up in the air. And I'm looking in the car and I'm staring at Johnny. I remember Johnny and Red saying, this ain't right, something's not right here. And, and Red came to the car and he was kind of, Mike, don't, don't worry, everything's under control, because he saw I got a little bit nervous. And it was at that point that I really realized something was up. And um, I got more curious at that point. I was maybe, you know, 12, 13 years old. What's your overall feeling about the mob being in the music industry in the 60s and the 70s? Well, it was unavoidable. I mean, they were already in the jukebox business, the vending machine business, uh, uh, the nightclub business. So they were in the entertainment business. We were apparently going to be on Roulette Records. That was the first offer I couldn't refuse. And uh, uh, that afternoon we went up and, and met all the executives and uh, Morris Levy, the head of the label, and he was, as I say, right out of central casting. I mean, he weighed about 250. His shaking hands with him was like grabbing a catcher's mitt, you know? And he talked like this. And we learned incrementally that the reason for all the drama was because Roulette Records, in addition to being a functioning indie label, and a pretty good one, they had a bunch of hits, uh, was also a front for the Genovese crime family in New York. So this is the Brill Building. This is where Sonny and his Confederates held songwriter Paul Vance out the window by his legs in a dispute over royalties. The royalties were for a hit record. It was leader of the laundromat. Sonny said he did it as a favor to Mo Levy. And then uh -huh. Ron Dante told me that you were the you were the one who challenged Morris on the royalties for the song. Oh yeah, we've had a fist fight. Vance punched Levy, knocked him down. And at that point, all his henchmen come out, all the mafiosa guys. They pick me up and they're going to throw me out. I'll never forget the window, window, the window. You dumb bastard. So after that, they were all friends. No, it was, it was amazing. Morris Levy looked at me and says, you're the only guy that ever knocked me off my feet. From now on, you are my buddy forever. How'd I hang it out? Hey, listen, you had to make money. It was tough. What we done in New York is unbelievable. Of course, you had that Morris Levy robbed everybody. Was he with anyone? Yeah, he was with somebody. He was a good friend of mine. Couldn't, couldn't do to him what I wanted to do. You know who we put with me? Bobby Diamond. He gave me Bobby Diamond. Yeah. yeah. A hell of a singer. Yeah. They were nice days, though. They were different days. The people hey, we were different. Oh, you got a legend. What legend? I said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. A legend? I said, I thought a legend had to do something great. But you did a hell of a great thing. You showed the world that there's still guys that'll take all the punishment in the world and still stand up. I said, I did that? He said, yeah. Right. You say it, I'll listen to you. How's that, pal? Yes, the mob has this sort of uh, mystique about it and Americans and are in love with the Sopranos and Goodfellas and all that, but think about really what that life is involved. What does, what is that? It's, it's a life of, of, of violence. You, you have to look over your shoulder. You have to worry about getting killed. You have to worry about, is the guy sitting next to me wearing a wire? It's, it's really no way to live. So I'm going to search the vault for Francis. And here we have Gregory Scarpa. Gregory Scarpa was a Colombo capo who became a top echelon informant for the FBI in 1961. There's a lot in here on the hierarchy of the Mafia and the language they use, like, uh, you know what a piece of work is? A piece of work is when you kill someone. Look, 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 look. <laughs> you have to look at this. So here he's talking about the whole hierarchy of the family, of, of a mafia family. The boss, acting captain, good fellows, button men, soldier. Ah, it's right here. It's right here. It's right here. Scarpa gave them information so that they could put him back in prison. 
So it wasn't just providing information about the structure of the family. He sent Sonny Frances back to prison. My father honestly sat me down one day and said, listen, um, if you're kidnapped, we're not going to pay a ransom. What did you say? Okay. And he explained, it's not going to make a difference. He says, the object is to get, do everything you possibly can to get away. Because once they get you, they're not going to let you go. How old were you when you had that conversation? Uh, about 12. Now, my father had come, had worked for Bobby Kennedy on the crime case. The nation's underworld gets the unwelcome spotlight of publicity as the Senate's investigation subcommittee begins new hearings on crime. Attorney General Robert Kennedy paints a grim picture of the rise of lawlessness under the Cosa Nostra, or Mafia. But from that, uh, he, Bob Green was recruited uh, by Newsday. They brought him on to be an investigating reporter. And that was his love. He wrote an article that was very, very informative about a guy who most people never heard about, living next door to them, because he lived like a regular guy. He was not like Carlo Gambino, who lived on a house on the water in Massapequa. When he started writing about the mob, they got agitated um, and started acting like mobsters. Most people never knew who John Franzese was. And that's why Bob Green was probably his biggest enemy, because he let people know that this fellow lived on the same street as they did. I think it was very important at the time. I mean, that made it, you know, my dad public enemy number one at that point in time. I remember it was a huge article, The Hood in Your Neighborhood. I remember my dad walking across the lawn. You know, I heard about it in school. You know, kids started talking about it. It, it, it was, uh, that was the thing that really brought my dad to the forefront. We get threats. The threats got real and too close. So all of a sudden I had to be taken to kindergarten in a police car. Did you know he was framed? Well, I know that there are people who say that, and I've been reading no, the court I'm records. Telling. But I'm telling you, as we sit here now, Park, Zaya, Cadero, Smith, Crabby, Florio, I knew every name and I knew every one of those persons. Sonny was framed. 